Thank you. I've realized I've made a huge mistake uh, that my talk title was not as descriptive as it could be, but I'm glad everyone could make it. Uh, just so have an idea, who here has already programmed at least a little bit in Elixir? Please raise your hands. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Cool. So this talk is about gen stage and flow. And those are abstractions we have been exploring for Elixir for a while, and we are going to go into them uh, with detail. And the reason we have these abstractions in Elixir, it's because we have been, since the beginning of the language, before we reached 1.0, we kind of have this plan in mind where we wanted to make it straightforward for developers to get their code from eager to lazy to concurrent and then to distribute it. Okay, and that's, that could be like the second title of the talk in a way, because you're going to be exploring this. Um, so if you're not familiar what those mean exactly right now, don't worry, we are going to build up to each of those elements. And in order to do that, we are going to use an example, an example which if you are in doing data processing, you, you'll be aware this is an extremely cliche example. But it is cliche for a reason, because it covers the most important scenarios okay, of what we need to discuss in order to uh, have that path from eager to distribute it. So the problem is word counting. We may have a text, maybe small, maybe large, and we want to count the words in that text. So for example, roses are red, violets are blue, right? Imagine that this is our text. And, um, we want to count the words in there. So if we have that as an input, as an Elixir string, as an input, we want to get an output, which in, in Elixir is going to be a map where the keys are the words and the values are how many times that word has appeared. Um, okay, and how we are going to solve this in Elixir? The simplest solution is to use the enum module, which is eager. Okay, so how, how a solution is going to look like? So the first thing we want to do, for example, imagine that the, this poem or whatever we want to count the words for, it's in a text file. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to call file.read. And that's going to load the whole file into memory. Okay, then we can say, uh, so we are going to get file.read. It's going to load the whole file into memory. So now, for example, if we have that small poem, that's what we have in memory right now. And then if we say uh, string.split, we can break that whole file into a bunch of lines. Okay, so now instead of having a huge string, I have uh, a list with multiple strings, each of those strings being a line of that original text. Right, so we are progressing, right? We had the whole file, now we can break it into lines. And then now the next step is that we want to go over each line and break each of those lines into words so we can later count those words, right? So what we want to do, the next step, we want to call a num flat map. And what that's going to do is that for um, each item in, in this collection, right, which is uh, a list of lines, we want to go over each line, we are going to break that into words, and that's going to give us a list of words which are going to flatten everything together. Right, so that's what flat map does. We go over each line, we break that into a list of words, and we flatten everything into a final uh, list of words. And now that we have this list of words, we need to count them. Okay, and to count that, uh, we use a reduce, or in other languages, it would be called fold. So what we want to go is that we want to go over each word, and we are going to have a map where we're going to start those words. So we're going to say, hey, map, do you have this word? If the map has that word, we want to increment the number of occurrences of that word by one. If we don't have that word, we want to introduce that word into the map, okay, with the count of one. And that's what we are going to do. We are going to call enum reduce, and, we are, and reduce is going to go over the list of words with the initial state of an empty map. Then for every word, we are going to try to update the map with that word an initial value of one. So if that word is not in the map, its initial count is going to be one because it has just appeared for the first time. And then if it already exists, we are going to increment it by one so we can count everything correctly. And we get the final result. We get a map where the keys are words and the values are how many times each of that 
uh, each of those words have appeared. Cool. That's a solution, that's an eager solution, right? And the reason why it's eager, it's because as we saw, at every step, we have the whole results into memory, right? So the first thing we did was to load the whole file into memory. And then the next thing we did was to go over the whole file, over the whole contents we had in memory, and break that into uh, a list of lines. And then we went and built a list of words, and then we built a map, okay? So what are the advantages of being eager, okay? It's very simple. It's the easiest conceptual module that we, can, uh, that we have. It's, easier, it's simple, it's very easy to reason about, right? We can go over each step, and we know exactly what we had before and what we are going to have after, okay? It is also very efficient for small collections. So if you are working with uh, small texts, that's the most efficient approach that we have to solve this particular problem in Elixir. But it has one big problem, which is very inefficient for large collections, especially if you have multiple passes. Why is that? Because, let's see, why is that, right? So imagine that now, instead of loading a small, of reading a small poem, we need to read a really large file, right? So like a five gigabytes, 10 gigabytes file. Now we are loading that whole file into memory. Boom, 10 gigabytes into memory. And now the next step is going to split that 10 gigabytes file into a bunch of lines, and then it's going to build a big list with all the lines, okay? And it's even worse later on. If we have to go over each of those lines, break into words, now we're going to have a really big list with all of the words. And uh, it's so big that uh, I've run some benchmarks later on comparing all those different solutions that this step in particular, it did not, I was not patient enough to wait for it to finish. Uh, the final solution, when we get to the end, took 15 seconds, and this one, after uh, three minutes, I was like, okay, I give up. It's not relevant, right? So uh, eager, it's simple, really straightforward, but uh, it becomes inefficient for some scenarios. If we have large collections, or if we have a bunch of passes, because each of those passes, we are getting a new result, right? So we are computing new results over and over again. So, posing that problem, like, okay, that's straightforward, word counting, I can use enum and I can compute the results, but if I have a large file that doesn't work, how can we improve that? We can be lazy, that's the next step. Okay, so from eager, now we are trying to become lazy. And this is a feature that has existed in Elixir since version 1.0. And the idea uh, with laziness in Elixir, we call, laziness in Elixir is expressed with something that we call streams, okay? So every time you see a stream in Elixir, or you see the word in Elixir, what it means is that it's lazy. You can think of it as a recipe. So now if we use file.stream instead of file.read, um, to, to read the file. Just one question. Can you at the back uh, see the, the code quite well? Beautiful, okay. So I'm not going to be worried over that. Beautiful, so instead of calling file.read that is going to read the whole file into memory, you're going to call file.stream. And file.stream returns a stream, which is a recipe. And what this recipe has is like, oh, when you need, to, when you need the contents of that file, only then I'm going to open the file, and when I open the file, I'm going to give you what is in the file line by line. So this is really good because we are no longer loading the whole file into memory. Instead, we have a recipe that knows how to give line by line of that file. This is great. And now, instead of calling, so now this stream already knows how to give us a line by line uh, of that text. So what is the next step? Is to go line by line, breaking that into words. And we could use a num flat map, but as we saw, a num is eager, right? It's going to build this whole list of words. So what we use instead, very simple, we change from num to a stream. And what is going to happen here is that we are incrementing that recipe. So now we're saying, okay, I want to, when, whenever you need the results, okay, whenever you need to iterate over this, we are going to open the file, and they are going to give you line by line, and then for each line, I'm going to break that line into words. So the way it works is that we get the first line, and then we break that line into words, and then we are going to give the words one by one for the first line. 
When the first line is over, we go to the next line, and then we break one by one in that and serve those words one by one. So this is really good. We are no longer loading the whole contents into memory anymore. So now we have, so what we have here is a stream, is a recipe that knows how to give us each word of that document, okay, one by one without loading it into memory. So now we can go to the final step where we actually need to open the file and get the words and put that into a map, which is what we do exactly as before. Now we call it numReduce because now we want to convert that recipe into something real. So we call in and reduce, and then we are going to build the map as before, and we have the same result, okay? So lazy. It folds the computations. It's a recipe, right? It allows us to tell how we want to process those things, and then at the end, we go line by line, item by item, sorry, word by word, item by item, okay? It is less memory usage because now we are not loading things, everything into memory anymore, but it does have a cost in computation. Okay, because now we have this abstraction of expressing things lazily. But if you have large collections or if you have multiple passes, then it's worth it, right? Because it allows us to work with large or even infinite collections, right? If something is infinite and you don't need to compute the final result, you can use streams to model that, okay? You can use streams to model reading from a socket and put into another socket and have that thing running infinitely because it never loads everything into memory. Okay, cool. And when we added streams to the language, then one question, we, we came up with one question, which is, look, we have those streams, which are recipes of how we want to do the computation. What if we can get those recipes and say, oh, I want to run this part of a recipe in one core, and I want to run this other part of the recipe in another core, and so on and so on. So I started to think about how can we use those recipes to leverage concurrency? Okay, and the answer to that question uh, is flow. It's one of the things we're going to talk about today. Okay, so I'm going to just give you an idea of how flow is going to look like. Don't worry a lot about the details. Then we're going to come back to flow and explain everything part by part. Okay, so how can we convert that code that we just saw that it's lazy, okay, into something concurrent? So the first step is the same as before. We, we still need to know how to get contents from uh, the file lazily, okay? So we start with file stream. And now what we are going to do is that we are going to convert that stream into a flow, okay? And then we are going to use similar operations as before. We are going to call flow flat map. We are going to call flow partition, which are going to understand later what it does. And we are going to call flow reduce. And at the end, we are going to have the same result as before. So now we went from enum, which is eager, to streams that are lazy, to flows that are concurrent, okay? And we are going to go line by line later about with this code snippet, okay? So don't worry about it so far. But what, so, but what do we gain and what do we lose when we, think about concur when we think about concurrency? So first, we give up ordering, right? And we give up an idea of locality because that's exactly what we want, right? If we want things to, ru to run concurrently, it means that they are no longer running in the same place, right? They are now running in different places. And in Elixir, we would say they are running in different processes, those very cheap, very lightweight thread of execution, okay? So uh, now they are running in a bunch of different places. And because we have a bunch of uh, entities, a bunch of processes doing the work, the work that comes out of them, now it's out of order. We no longer have ordering because, you know, they are all working at the same time, and we don't want to worry about ordering. Like, as they receive and as they emit items, all those different processes, it's going to be how it is, okay? So we are giving up the idea of ordering. We can always order later on, but initially, ordering is lost, okay? And we are, we are losing also the idea of locality. Not, things are in different places, okay? We lose that, but it's good because we gain concurrency, which is exactly what we wanted, okay? And flow as streams allow us to work both with finite, which is bounded data, and infinite collections, and we are going to see how, okay? However, similar to, um, you know, when I said enum is very good for small collections, right? And then lazy is going to be very good if you need infinite collections. There's also gotchas to flow, 
right? So for example, imagine that you watch this talk and you go back to your Elixir code and say, I'm going to replace all my enum calls to flow. That's potentially, very likely, is not going to make your code faster, right? Because there is an overhead now of setting up how those, those co-current processes, they're going to talk to each other, okay? So it's not magic. There is an overhead when data flows for processes. So it requires volume. It requires you to have a lot of data, or it requires you to be relying a lot on I.O. or CPU bound work for it to be worth it, okay? So, and before we go into deep details of the talk, uh, I just want to share a couple statistics about Flow. So the Flow library, it's actually quite small. It's just 1,200 lines of code. And it has more lines of documentation than uh, lines of code. And this was very interesting because it became very clear that the problem with Flow is not necessar necessarily a technological problem. It's rather a domain problem. If you want to use Flow efficiently, you need to learn how to use Flow properly and how to think uh, on this domain where you lose ordering and you use locality, okay? So um, given that, I want to split this talk. So this is an introduction, right? So I want to split this talk in two parts. So the first one we are going to answer, well, if Flow is only 1,200 lines of code, how is it implemented, right? How is the implementation small to be able to, uh, given everything we can do with it, how the implementation can be so small, okay? And the other one, which is, well, if the documentation is actually the important bit, so how can we reason about flow? What, what do we need to know in order to write our flows for concurrent, concurrent programming um, efficiently, okay? Or effectively, rather. Cool. So let's answer the first question. So how is Flow implemented? We probably have an idea of how Flows are implemented. We use something called GenStage, okay? So what is GenStage? So in Elixir, we have those processes, which are those very lightweight, very cheap thread uh, of execution, right? And, you, and they are primitives that come with the virtual machine. But when we are writing um, software in Elixir or in Erlang, we, don't all, we are not always spawning those processes directly. We are using existing abstractions. And those abstractions, they typically come with this gen prefix, okay? So we have something which is very, very common, which is the gen server. And gen stands for generic, right? So gen server is a generic server, which is something about a client and a server, right? It, it allows you to write a process that is going to receive requests from other processes and respond to those requests. Gen stage is quite similar where it's a generic computation stage, okay? And as we'll see, stages, they can be producers, they can be consumers, they can be producer consumers, and so on. So, so what is gen stage? It's a new behavior. Like we, the same way we have gen server, now we have gen stage, a new behavior that allows you to model how your processes are going to work. And it's all about exchanging data between different stages transparently and with back pressure, okay? And we have three kinds of stages, or they are producers, or they are consumers, or they are producer-consumers. So, for example, here's how we can have a gen stage pipeline with multiple stages connected to each other. So we start with a producer that uh, sends events to a producer-consumer that may send an event to another producer-consumer, to another producer-consumer, and uh, then it ends on the consumer. So all you need to do with gen stage is that you need to tell how they connect to each other, and gen stage is going to take care of sending the data between them, okay? But every time we have a pipeline like this, we start to ask some questions, for example, what is going to happen if the producer-consumer in the middle is slow, right? Imagine that, you know, the producer is sending data really, really fast, but that producer-consumer needs to do uh, a step that is slow, and then it cannot keep up. If the producer is only sending data without reasoning, without thinking about the rest of the pipeline, if he's just sending data, we can have issue, right? Because we can be sending work and work to that producer consumer, right? Which starts to have its queue of work growing, growing, and growing. And if we're not careful, we can even run out of memory because you're, we are getting data from external systems put into this pipeline. And then there is something slow in that pipeline that is just receiving work and then eventually cannot keep up with all the work that we are asking it to do. So 
When we have this scenario, uh, which is one of the main reasons why GenStage was designed, we were like, okay, so we need a way to signal between those stages, between those computational processes, that, okay, I, I can do more work, or wait, I'm busy, I cannot do more work, right? So the way we do that in Elixir is that we say, gen stages, they are demand-driven. And what it means is that um, the producer cannot just start sending data like crazy to consumers. It usually works like this instead. So the first step is that we're going to say, I want the consumer to subscribe to the producer. Okay, so the first step is for the consumer to subscribe. And even after this step, the producer cannot send data immediately. Then, after subscription, the consumer first needs to say, okay, you can send me 10 items. You can send me 1,000 items. So we say that this consu the consumer is sending a demand to the producer. Here is how many items I'm willing to process. So you can say, okay, I'm going to ask for 10. And then the producer can send the events to the consumer, but in a way it does not exceed the demand, right? And the sending of the event and the sending of the demand, it's asynchronous. So, um, so the producer, for example, the consumer can ask, hey, give me 10. The producer can say, I have only five for now, so I'm going to send you five, and then I can send you two or three or whatever more later. In a way, it does not exceed the demand. Uh, the consumer can say, ask 10, and then it can change its mind and say, okay, actually, I can process 20, so send me uh, 10 more, right? So they, this, this, is, this conversation is ongoing, okay? And what is really nice about this demand-driven aspect is that if we go back to that pipeline, the demand thing, we can push it from the consumer to the whole beginning of the pipeline. So we say that we push the demand to our system boundaries. So, for example, in this case, we, we're going to say, well, the, the C is going to ask B for 10 items, and then B is going to ask A uh, for 10 items, okay? And then A can get those items from somewhere, from an external source or from an internal source, and send those things downstream, downstream, always in a way that we are not going to exceed the original demand, okay? So about being demand-driven, it's a message contract. It, those are messages, those are asynchronous messages that the stages are exchanged with each other that say, hey, give me 10, and then like, look here, here are five, here are five more, and so on. It's really nice because, as we saw, if we have a pipeline, right, we can communicate this whole demand, right, to the system boundary. So we are pushing the back pressure to the system boundary which is good because if you're getting data from external systems, you know exactly how much data you need to get from those external systems. And GenStage is actually just one implementation of this contract of sending messages uh, between those processes. So if at the end of this talk you say, mm, I, I don't really like GenStage, I, I think I have uh, ideas for a better abstraction, you can come up with your own abstraction and connect to a GenStage pipeline exactly because uh, it's, it's just a message contract. Okay, let's see an example, okay? Let's have a very simple example where we have a producer, which is a counter. So what this producer does, that is, it's, it emits, it counts, it emits events as counting. So it's going to emit 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and goes like that forever. And we have a printer which prints the events as they come, okay? So here's how the producer looks like. So here's some Elixir code. So what we're going to do is that, uh, as usual in Elixir, um, most of the Elixir code, the huge majority of Elixir code, exists inside modules. So we're saying, look, here is a module that is a producer, and we, are going, and we want to bring the gen stage, and we want to implement the gen stage behavior. So we say, use gen stage. And now I need to implement two callbacks, which we implement with two functions. The first function uh, is init, which is going to be called when the stage starts and it's going to receive the counter, the value that we want to start counting from, which is usually going to be zero, okay? And then we return, okay, this stage is a producer, and it has an initial state of counter. And then we need to implement init, and for producers, we need to implement another callback, which is handle demand. And handle demand is called every time a consumer asks for a given amount of items. Right? So handle demand is going to be called uh, with the demand, how many items the, the consumer asked, and the state, which is the counter, which is where we are in our counting from 0 to 1 to 3 and so on. 
So what we do is that we are going to generate the event from the counter until the counter plus the demand minus one. We are going to see exactly how this works. And then we are going to say, OK, so every time there is a demand, I'm going to emit those events and change my state. OK, it works like this. So imagine that we start this producer, and then we start with a counter of zero. OK, and then a consumer asks for 10 items. So we are going to say, OK, so handle demand, when we give it the initial demand of 10 and the state of zero is going to return no reply, and then it's going to return a list with exactly the amount of demand we asked it for, with 10 events, which in this case is from 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 9, gives us exactly 10, and the state for the next time around is going to be 10. So the next time we receive another demand, let's say in this case, five items, we are going to say, OK, now handle demand is going to return no reply, 10, allow 12, 13, and 14 as the event, and the new state now is going to be 15, and so on and so on, right? So we are, th this stage is in this loop where it's receiving demands, it's building events from that demand, right? Always increasing, always counting, and return uh, the, those responses. And the consumer is quite similar. We define a module called consumer, we could give it any name we want. And it's also, we say, use gen stage. And it needs to implement an init callback with one important difference here, where instead of saying it is a producer in the first element of that tuple, we say uh, this is a consumer. And this consumer is a stateless. So for the state, I pass the atom to say the state does not matter, right? It, it could be whatever you wanted there. And, and while the producer needs to implement handle demand every time the consumer asks for something, um, the consumer needs to implement handle events, which is invoked every time the producer sends events. Okay, so handle events is called with uh, the events the producer send. It's called also with a second argument, which is which producer sent us uh, those events, and a state, which in this case it does not matter. So what we do is that we are going to sleep for one second to kind of simulate as if this uh, consumer was doing some work. So we're going to sleep for one second, we are going to print the events, and then we are going to say, OK, I, I don't have anything to do with this consumer. It's the end of the pipeline, so I don't have nothing to return, and so on. OK? So after we did that, so now we define the producer, we define the consumer, OK? Uh, now we can connect them together. So what we're going to do is that I'm going to start the producer. So I'm going to call gen stage start link, and I want to start a producer that is going to count from zero. Right? And that's going to uh, return a producer for us, a producer process, a producer stage. And then I'm going to say, well, I also want to start a consumer, and I'm passing OK as the input because the state does not matter, so that's fine. Whatever we pass there would be OK. And then we're going to say, I'm starting this consumer, and this is the printer. So now I have a producer here, a consumer here. They are running. They don't know about each other yet. So the last step is, OK, I just tell the, the consumer, which is the printer, to subscribe to the producer, which is the counter. And as soon as we do that, we are going to wait one second, and then we are going to see events printed. And we are going to see the first time, we are going to see 500 events printed, and then we are going to wait for another second, and we are going to see uh, 500 more, and so on, and so on. So now, so we define how to behave when the for the producer, we define how it should behave when it receives demand. For the consumer, we define how it should behave when it receives events. And gen stage took care of the whole communication and how and asking for more and handling all that back pressure approach. Okay, took care of that for us. All we need to do is to worry about the business logic of what that stage needs to do at that particular moment. However, you may be wondering, why 500? Right? Where this number came from? Okay, so in order to understand exactly why we got 500, uh, we need to talk about the subscribe options. So here in this code, uh, we called sync subscribe, right? And we say, I want to, the consumer to subscribe to that producer. We can pass a bunch of options when we are subscribing. And we are going to go over uh, two of those options, which are max demand, which is the maximum amount of events to ask. And the default is 1,000. So by default, when you connect the consumer to the producer, it's going to say, hey, give me 1,000, all right? And then we also have the minimum demand, which is the value that when reached, we ask for more events, okay? So in order to understand exactly how this works, 
Let's ignore minimum demand for now. Let's imagine that we are connecting the consumer to the producer, and, the initial, and we have the max demand of 10 and the minimum demand of zero. Okay? So what's going to happen is the following. The consumer is going to ask for 10 items. Okay? So we connected them, and then the consumer says, hey, give me 10. And then the producer is going to produce that and send to the consumer. So the consumer eventually is going to receive 10 items. Okay? And then the consumer receives 10, and then the consumer is going to process those 10 items, and then it's going to ask for 10 more. Okay? This is bad. Why this is bad? Because the consumer is saying, give me 10, and then it's waiting, and then it's saying, and then it's receiving those 10, it's processing all those 10, and then it's asking for 10 more and waiting, right? So this is it's not good because the consumer is spending a lot of time waiting for the producer to send data. And similarly, the producer is waiting a lot of time. It can be idle because the, the consumer is not asking for anything. It's busy processing. This is not good, right? We want to find a way where we keep both busy, right? Both... Uh, doing work. And that's why we have minimum demand. So if we set the minimum demand to zero, okay, it's going to work, oh sorry, if we set the minimum demand from zero to five, this is how it's going to work. The consumer is going to ask for 10 items, and then the consumer is going to receive 10 items, but it knows that as soon as it processes half of those items, right, as soon as it goes to five, it can ask for more. So what the consumer does now is that it's going to process only five of those 10 items, and then after it processes those initial five, it's going to ask for five more. So now we are in a state where the consumer processed half, it has the other half to process, and it already asked the producer to start working on the next five. So while the consumer is processing the remaining five, the producer is already doing work to give us the next the next five. And this is good because now we don't have this work-stop relationship, right? They are, uh, ideally, if this is well-balanced, right, it's, they are both working all the time. Cool. There's a bunch more we could talk about gen stage and other goals we had to gen stage. So uh, we wrote a, uh, an announcement when it first came out. So I recommend checking that out and learning more if you are interested in this particular aspect. So going back to our topics, right, uh, we kind of answered the first question. How is Flow implemented? At the core of Flow, we have gen stage. We have a 80 lines of code, a really small gen stage. Okay? So now we are ready for the next question, which is how to reason about flows. Cool. So at the beginning of the talk, we started with that cliche example. Roses are red, violets are blue, and we want to do word counting. Okay, so that's our input at the top, and then we have our out output at the bottom. And um, we showed the concurrent solution using flow. We had this code, right? And then we said, well, all flows, they are lazy, right? They are also a recipe that tells us how to do some work. And then at the end, when we want the final result, we can get that final result concurrently, which is the same result as we had for eager and lazy. Okay, so what we're going to do now for uh, the rest of this talk, for the second part of the talk, is to go over this flow, over these, all those lines of code that we have written, line by line, and understand how it works and how it gives us concurrency. Okay? So let's start it. So the first step is file.stream, which as we know, it's going to return a stream that is a recipe that knows how to read the contents of a file line by line. And then the next step is that we convert that stream into, an, into a flow. And the flow, like a stream, it's a recipe, but now we can think it's a concurrent recipe. It's a recipe that later on, it's going to break it apart and execute concurrently. And when we do that, when we call a flow from a Nurbo with a stream, what happens here is that we are going to create one process, one gen stage that is a producer that every time other processes ask it for items, it's going to emit line by line of that file as items, right? So it's like an upgrade, right? Like we have this stream that knows how to read items of the file line by line, and now we are putting it inside a stage, and it can do all the things that we we're talking about gen stage now. It cannot do that because it's running inside a stage. So we did an upgrade, right? We put that stream in its own stage, in its own process, and it knows now how to send uh, items to a bunch of other processes. 
Cool. So now that we have flow from an Uber and we have the stream running inside the process, we can call flow flat map. And what flow flat map is going to do is the following. It's going to say, OK, so I have this uh, stage here, which is the producer, and now I want to execute this computation. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to start a bunch of other stages to do precisely this computation. OK? And, um, and that's how the flow is going to work. So let's, let's imagine that we are going to execute this flow as it's here right now, without all the other parts, right? How this is going to work? It's going to work like this. So we have, we have the producer process, the producer stage, OK? And then uh, it knows how to emit the, those uh, line by line, right? So we're going to say, OK, uh, I want to process the first line, which is roses are red. So the producer is going to see that first line. It's going to say, OK, I'm going to send you I'm going to send this line to one of those four stages. So I can send that line to stage one. And that stage one will now do the job of breaking that line into words. And then the next line, and that's what it does. Right? It's going to go roses are red. right? And it's going to break that, um, that line into words. But at the same time, that stage one is breaking the first line into words. Another stage is going to ask for the second line, which could be, for example, stage four. So the producer is going to send that line to stage four, which is going to break the same line into words. Right? So what we did is that when we started using Flow, instead of having one thing that consumed the stream, is now, now we can have many things consuming the stream. And that's why we lose ordering, right? Because they're all consuming those lines coming from the file at the same time. The end result is not guaranteed to be roses are red, violets are blue. They're going to be breaking apart. They're going to, everything's happening at the same time, so they can be mixed and so on. Okay. So that's what we have so far, right? We have uh, this flow that knows how to get the data from a producer, right, and send it to a bunch of different stages that are breaking each of those lines into words. And you can see here that each of those stages here at the bottom, they, they don't have a state. What, what they do is that they get each line, break it into word, and move it forward, OK? But that's not actually what we want, right? Because what is, what is our end result? What do we want at the end? We want a map with the word counting, right? So let's try to change that. So let's do that for each stage, OK? Instead of sending the words forward, we want each stage to count the words, to put the words into that same map we have talked about before. So after flow.flatmap, let's call flow.reduce, OK? And let's see what happens. OK, so we're going to say, OK, now instead of each stage sending the words forward, we want to get those words and put into a map and compute this final result. So let's see what's going to happen here. So now we have that same schema, right? And then we start with roses are red. And we are going to send that to stage one, which is going to break into words. And it's going to put that into a map, where we have the words are red and roses. And now we are going to get uh, the next line, violets are blue. We're going to send that to another stage, which is going to do the same thing and break that line into words. So in a way, it works, right? Now we, have, we are computing those maps concurrently at the same time, OK? But we have one big problem here. What is the problem? This is the problem. The word R, for example, we can find it in one stage here, and then we can also find in the other stage there. And why this is not good? This is not good because if you want to do a final word counting where you want to get all the words, it means you need to go over all the stages, get all of their maps, and merge it together into a final map. Right? And, that's, and when we are merging it together, we need to check for duplicate words, right? Because if we have duplicate words, we need to sum them together. And this is not good, because if we are breaking the word apart and then later putting together into a final map, this final map step is, is serial, right? It, if, so imagine that we had like 42 processes, right? We would have to be merging everything into one final map, and that's going to be slow. That's going to be the opposite of what we want. It's not going to be concurrent. You need this final map to be built in one place. OK? So that's not good. Like having the data, the same data, the same count for a single world scattered around all those different stages, that does not work. OK? That's not what we want. So how do we solve that? So let's go back to our problem, right? So we have the string. We make it in the room and call flat map. 
And we know that flat math is giving us all of the words, right? It's splitting into words concurrently. But we know that we cannot simply change those stages to build the map. We need to do something before. We cannot just call reduce. We tried that, it didn't work. So what do we do? We call partition. And the whole idea of partition is that it's going to look at each of those words, and it's going to guarantee that if two different stages sees the same word, it's going to send that word to the same process at the bottom. So when we call flow.partition, we start a new layer of workers. Okay? And it's guaranteed that if, for example, stage one, added, uh, stage one and stage four, if they see the same word, they are going to route to the same stage, for example, stage C or stage B. Right? This is good because now the data is not going to be scattered around anymore. So now that we are partitioning, we can call, so we can see that now that we are partitioning, each stage um, on the top here, stage one, two, three, and four, it's connected to all these stages at the bottom, right? And now that we have that, we can call flow reduce because reducing will be happening here at the end. Let's do the example, the simulation, which is going to make this very clear, okay? So we are going to start again. Roses are red. We are going to send that to stage one, which now only has the responsibility of breaking that line into words and routing that line to the proper processes. Okay? So it's going to say, hmm, I can see here that roses, when I partition this, should go to stage one. So it sends that to stage one, oh, sorry, to stage A, and stage A is going to put that in the map. And it's going to see, I can see that the words, the word R should go to stage C. And stage C now is going to get that word and put it on the map. Right? And I can see that the word red also goes to stage C. So I'm going to put that into the map as well. So now when, we, when the other stage is processing the line, violets are blue at the same time, okay, it knows that the word R in violets are blue should go to stage C. And that's exactly what happens. The word R goes to stage C. And now R is correctly incremented by two on stage C, and it's no longer scattered around for all those stages, right? That's why partitioning is important, because it guarantees that if we see the same kind of data, data with the same shape, we can route it to the proper place, and then we can keep all those partitions disjoint. We don't have data scattered around, okay? And what we have here, when we are looking at this thing at the end here, right, where we have a producer and we have stages at the top, one to, to four, where they are just doing really straightforward work, where they receive input, they compute something and give the output, and then we have those stages at the bottom that are accumulating a final state, right? We can name all those stages at the top, from one to four, we can call them mappers, right? Because all they do is to map on apply a function on the input, right? And, and send those outputs back. And those stages at the bottom, they are reducers because they have the state and they are receiving those inputs and they are applying to its own state that it's building around. Okay, so this is a map reduce. We're doing map reduce concurrently. Okay, so, so now we understand what this flow does, right? Those are all the steps we have so far. So we start with a file stream, we upgrade it to a flow, so it is a producer, and now flow flat map is a bunch of mappers that are receiving lines, breaking towards, and then we partition, create a new a layer of stages that are going to compute the final state. And now the last step, if we want the final result in memory, if you don't want the final result in memory, if you want to write to a file or to a web service, you could just continue doing like flow.something and write an external service. But if you want a final result in memory, we can call enum.into. That's going to put everything into a final map, really straightforward, because now we don't need to check for duplicate words on different stages. Okay, and that gives the same result that we had from the beginning of the talk. Cool. So we know that reduce tree collects all data into maps, right? And when it's done, we are streaming those maps into enum into that collects everything into a final result. Okay? So going back to the beginning of the talk, right? We started with eager, and then we made it lazy, and now we're able to make everything concurrent uh, with flow. So we started with a num, which is our eager code, and then uh, with very few changes, we were able to make it lazy. And now, by learning a little bit about the domain of concurrent processing, 
right? We were able to make it concurrent with Flow. And then I said that I ran some benchmarks. I don't remember the, the, the data set size uh, anymore, if it was one or 10 gigas, but this one, I was not patient enough, the eager one, right? Because it needs to build a huge list of words. I did not wait for it to finish. And the stream took one second in my, uh, one 60 seconds in my machine, one minute, and the flow took 18 seconds on my machine, on a machine with four cores. So this is really good, right? We almost got a four times improvement. There's a little bit of overhead there, uh, but this is really good, right? This is what we want. So, um, so what about flow, right? So as we saw, it provides map and reduce operations as well as partitioning, but it does a bunch of other stuff that we haven't talked about. Uh, we can also, so for example, if you have two flows, you can merge them together. If you have flows of data that you need to join, like database joins, we can do that with flow as well. We have, we have left join, we have inner join, we have right join, and so on. Um, it has a configurable batch size, um, which is by configuring the maximum in demand, you can control exactly how many items you're, you're going to send and those, those flowy stages are going to communicate. And it also has a bunch of data windowing features like trigger, watermarks that I didn't talk about, but as I say, we have 1,300 lines of documentation, so you can always read the documentation to find more information, okay? But there's one last question, right, which is, what about distributed? You said it's from eager to lazy to concurrent to distributed, right? And when you look at the Flow API, you can see that Flow, the Flow API has feature parity with frameworks like Apache Spark. However, there is no distribution or no execution guarantees. If something goes wrong in your flow, you, there is no checking point, right? You cannot restart the flow and come back from where you were before, right? So does it mean that this talk was for nothing, that this is not relevant because there is no distribution? Not really, quite the opposite. So there are a bunch of interesting papers. So for example, this one says, small inputs are common in practice. 40 to 80% of Cloudera customers map reduce jobs, and 70% of jobs in the Facebook trace have less than one gigabyte of input. And then another paper built on top of that, saying that for between 40 to 80% of the jobs submitted to map reduce systems, and in this case, he's saying distributed map reduce systems, you would be better off just running them on a single machine. There is a very interesting paper which is called Cost, where it measures that there are many problems that people they are using. Uh, distributed systems to solve those problems. And sometimes, if you solve that problem on a single machine, okay, removing all the cost that is related to distribution, you're going to solve that problem like 40 times faster. There are some problems that is even faster solving on a single core because the coordination with multiple cores already introduced enough overhead to not, uh, to not make it efficient with multiple cores. So what do I mean by this, right? The single machine still matters. I like to say, like, this is medium data problems, right? If you're having medium data problems, which is like most of us are likely to have, right? Not big data problems. Uh, this is going to be a great way and likely the most efficient way to solve those problems, okay? And the positive news is that the gap between concurrent code and distributed code in Elixir is small because of the Erlang virtual machine, okay? So uh, what we need to focus, if we really want to have distribution, is on those durability checking point and concerns that allow, if something goes wrong, like if you're doing something distributed, there's this distributed computation and a node goes down. You don't want to restart everything, right? You want to pick up from where that node left. And that's where most of the work should go if we eventually want to be distributed. All right, that's what I had to talk about flow. I just want to share a little bit about uh, our inspirations. So ACK streams, uh, the whole back pressure contract that we talked about from, um, Gen stage, it's inspired by Aqua Streams. Um, we got a lot of inspiration API-wise for Flow. It came from Apache Spark. We, as I said, we have a bunch of features regarding windowing, triggers, watermarks. That comes from the Apache Bean project. And we also uh, have something called notifications, which is an internal mechanism, but it's a mechanism that's really neat that allows us to compute results we have without having a single source. Uh, using something that's called notifications. And that's the first time we saw it on the, was on the Microsoft NIAID project. And that's it. Uh, as Elixir, uh, a bunch of GenStage was built and designed at Platform Tech, which is the company I work for, the company that created Elixir. And that's what I had to share about today. Too. And that's it. Thank you. We have time just for two questions. There is one. Uh, I have 
I have a question. Uh, yeah. Is uh, Flow able to, you know, uh, fuse uh, two stages together? So, you know, uh, omit the barrier of uh, communicating as asynchronously in case of, for example, when an operation is, uh, it's faster to make an operation on a single process than passing it between two processes, for example. So the question is, if uh, Gen Stage or Flow is going to take care of you automatically if, you, if the computation is faster on a single core? So for, example, yeah. for example, we have uh, uh, Please two talk simple closer to the microphone. Uh, for yeah. example, we have two simple operations, uh, like uh, add one and uh, in the next stage add two to each element, for example. And uh, in that case, uh, uh, is uh, uh, flow able to, you know, merge those two Oh, beautiful, together. beautiful, yes, thank you. Um, so if we have, if we have, uh, like, if we have one, if we have, like, we, if we say flow.map and do something small, and then we say flow.map again, we do something small, this flow is going to merge the computations. Uh, so by default, flow doesn't create new layers. So if you call flow map, flow filter, flow flat map, that's all, always going to run in the same layer. It's just that the examples here, it was always one function mapping per layer. So the, question, so the answer is we don't need to merge because by default we are not creating multiple passes. It's always run. And just when you do a computation like flow partition or something in particular, that it's going to create a bunch of new layers because it has to. Right? But excellent question. Thank you. We had one more, I believe. One more question. Yeah. So I'll be around, so feel free like after the talk or around the event to come and ask. I'll be glad to answer. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, how does the partition work underneath? You know, you need to keep uh, somewhere a hash, which word sends to which reducer. Yes, and beautiful question. how does question. it work? Yeah, so partitioning, by default, we are going to calculate the hash on the event. So in this case, our events, they were words. So we'd calculate a hash on the world. But you, if you check the documentation for the flow partition function, you can pass exactly how you want to hash that. So, uh, so by default, we are going to hash on the term or whatever you're, on whatever you're sending. But if you have an application-based partitioning, because, for example, you need to partition by a group ID or something, you just pass an anonymous function to flow partition, and you can consider the partitioning. Yeah, and how are these hashes shared between They the don't need to be shared, right? Because uh, what you do is that you compute the hash, and then mm -hmm. if you have four reducer stages, so all the, all, all the producers, they, they have access to the same hashing function, right? Mm -hmm. So they invoke, invoke the same hashing function, and then they are going to compute the value. For example, uh, you, let, let's say that we have we had four stages at the bottom, right? A, B, C, and D. So your hash function is going to say exactly, this should go to A, or this should go to D, and so on. And you don't need to share the hash because all the producers, they have access to the same hashing function. Because remember, the flow is a recipe. Mm -hmm. When we are calling flow this, flow, flow that, flow that, we are not starting those processes yet. So just when you do something, then the flow materializes, and then we build the whole thing. And when we build, we pass to all producers what is the partitioning function. That's how they know how to partition the data. Thank you. Cool, yeah. So for the other questions, just find me around or come here right after. I think uh, we, have to, we have to finish right now. And yeah. So thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you.